Okay, so um, I, this is going to be a rather quick presentation because we've we've presented some of this before, uh, and I've learned that Meg is not here to follow up. So um, uh, we'll do what we can. So as we've reported uh, previously, this project is is trying to understand tectonic processes in in greenstone belts by comparison with with possible modern analogs. We've got a, a large team uh, spread across Canada and Germany that is working in areas of oceanic crust that have never been mapped before and producing maps at scales that we can directly compare with ancient terrains. And that's the goal of everyone pictured here. Um, the project is highly leveraged because of the cost of some of the activities in, in particular going to sea. And two of our key partners, in addition to Metal Earth, are, are Geomar, the, the uh, Helmholtz Center for Ocean Research in Germany. Um, and also more recently, the uh, CREATE program. Uh, we have a new uh, CREATE called IMAGE, uh, which is a project that, that is providing some critical training in seafloor mapping, which we discovered was, was sorely needed. Um, it's well established now that the formation of mineral deposits, uh, in this case showing VMS deposits, is closely linked to pulses of crustal growth through time. Um, the problem is that the record of crustal growth is not that well constrained, uh, and episodes of ore formation in particular are relatively occurring on relatively short time scales within this crude framework. So we want to be able to better recognize the short bursts of uh, crustal growth that predict where and when uh, major ore deposits uh, might have formed. And to address that question, we, we chose a study area um, in the Indo-Australian margin that contains some of the fastest growing crust on Earth today and also some of the highest predicted uh, mantle temperatures. If, if ever there was a place you wanted to compare to an Archean greenstone belt, um, this would be it, notwithstanding some of the tectonic uh, differences. Um, to understand the crustal growth in those places, we, we learned pretty quickly that we needed geological maps. And so we set out to create some of the first uh, geological maps in the oceans at, at one to a million scale. And this, this turned out to be a, a, a nearly a two year journey because among other things, we had to teach ourselves uh, how to do it. Nobody was doing this uh, at the time. We also went to sea and uh, where our approach has been almost identical to the Metal Earth approach of uh, working on transects uh, to produce the first really comprehensive uh, multidisciplinary geological and geophysical maps uh, of large regions uh, in the oceans. I previously reported on our, our seismic work in the Northern Lao Basin and our P wave tomography models. And Meg, who was supposed to be here, was going to talk about um, another project that's getting off the ground in easternmost Papua New Guinea, where we have a, another cruise scheduled at the end of next year. And we're also working in the, in the North, North Fiji Basin. The first map of the Lao Basin, which is uh, about, should be published any minute now, um, uh, identifies more than 40 different uh, uh, geological formations going back at least 30 or 40 million years. And so we've, we've fully reconstructed the uh, regional crustal growth within the whole of, of the Lao Basin. Making this map really taught us a huge amount about uh, crustal growth in the oceans, in the modern oceans, and we're, we're still analyzing it in detail. Um, but we have to be realistic about the scale of our first map, uh, which was almost the size of the Superior Province. So, if we want to know more about crustal growth in, in areas like the Abitibi Greenstone Belt, we have to get a lot closer and, uh, to the places of interest within this map area, and that's exactly what we're doing right now. Um, we're attempting to find uh, similarities at a fairly detailed level between certain uh, uh, volcanic and tectonic settings in the Lao Basin and elsewhere, and um, uh, Abitibi assemblages at a quarter million scale instead of one, one to one million scale. The structural framework of our, of our main study area was unraveled by Alan Baxter in our group who analyzed about 700 shallow earthquakes in the area and used the data to classify about 300 major faults um, in, in particular in the northern part of the Lao Basin. The most the interesting outcome of that was the discovery that the majority of the structures are strike slip faults rather than normal faults. 
which is what we would have expected for a major rift basin like this. And this reflects the oblique collision of the Pacific plate and the resulting microplate rotation uh, throughout, throughout this area. Identifying and classifying those structures was a major step forward. Uh, previously, models of this region involved only three plates, and suddenly we're looking at at least seven uh, plates with dimensions as small as, as 100 kilometers in diameter. And from, from this, it was clear that, uh, that the crust did not form from one dominant spreading center, but rather uh, from a, at seven different locations simultaneously. And this is what a major pulse of crustal growth looks like today. Um, it's basically a, a microplate factory. Um, the total length of the spreading centers uh, define those microplates uh, end to end is about a thousand kilometers and that's all packed in within a, a basin that's only 600 kilometers wide. And the clear message is that if you want to make a lot of crust uh, in a short period of time, you do it with seven spreading centers, not with one. And you make sure that there's necessary crustal uh, scale structures that can accommodate all of that growth. These, these have to be early uh, structures. Those features are the hallmarks of, of microplate breakouts, and the, they really represent the simultaneous growth of many different assemblages in different locations at the same time. Exactly what you need to endow crust with, with mineral deposits. So we got all that from our experience in the northern part of the Lao Basin and came up with some conclusions that we reported a few months ago. Essentially, back art crust formed simultaneously in many different locations. Um, by distributed extension. This is the norm. Uh, microplate breakouts and accelerated basin opening are accommodated by large scale uh, transcurrent fault zones, which must be early structures. Back arc crust is neither entirely oceanic nor entirely arc-like in its composition with extensive overprinting and inheritance because of those complexities. Uh, mantle input occurs uh, significantly at the intersections of translithospheric structures and especially at triple junctions, which I'm going to talk about in a minute. And intense crustal scale deformation really contributes to the abundance of, of magnetic and hydrothermal systems. So that's what we learned. Um, this seems to be adequately uh, explaining the difference between crust, which uh, we would classify as endowed, and crust which we would classify as not endowed. But we're still struggling, and this is where we're heading now, we're still struggling to recognize the different conditions that exist um, at the right scale, at the scale that can be compared to assemblages in greenstone belts. And so to make those comparisons, uh, we need new maps at, in the critical gap between about one to a million scale and about one to 100,000 uh, scale. In fact, we even invented a mapping school uh, uh, with the CREATE to train more mappers who could do this because it became clear that the, that the job is now rather significant and we're currently working on a portfolio of quarter million uh, map scales just within the Lao Basin um, with in, a, in about a dozen different, different locations. What are we mapping at those scales? Well, we're mapping uh, all the things you need to understand an assemblage, the structural and stratigraphic boundaries, the plate boundary deformation, fabric development, uh, uh, synvolcanic transcurrent faulting, arc rifting and foundering, rift propagation, distributed and extension, as well as the sedimentation that is associated with that, tectonic focusing of magma um, and uh, caldera formation processes. These are all the things we wanna know if we want to uh, better characterize, for example, assemblages uh, in the Abitibi Greenstone Belt. Um, the first question that comes to mind is, is what do the assemblage boundaries and the microplate boundaries uh, actually look like? And I'm going to briefly explore some of those now uh, at four locations in the northern Lao Basin in the Mangatolo Triple Junction right here, on the Funalai Rift right here, um, in the Rochambeau and Northwest Lao Spreading Centers, and then a brief mention of the Northeast Lao, uh, Lao Spreading Center. Um, an important thing to keep in, so this is a blow up of, of Meg's map, uh, an important thing to keep in mind in this is, is, is the distinction between assemblages and microplates. Um, and a simple example of that is the Futuna Spreading Center, which is at the center of the so-called Futuna assemblage. This contains all of the crust that originated by backyard spreading along the Futuna Spreading Center. The microplates, on the other hand, they're defined by crustal structures. 
Um, for example, there's a microplate that's subtended by the Futuna spreading center, a transform fault, another spreading center, a major uh, volcanic complex, interplate volcanic complex, and then a major deformation zone. And so it's important to keep these, these, these things um, uh, separate in your mind and, and maybe also important in mapping uh, Archean assemblages. Uh, just as on land, the assemblage boundaries fall into two categories that we're looking at, namely stratigraphic boundaries that are represented by uh, um, uh, different types of unconformities, all of which we've identified now in different parts of the northern Lao Basin, and also structural and te or tectonic boundaries, which range from transform faults to uh, detachment faults, which are becoming more important in major deformation zones. Some of these are magmatic, others are, are purely uh, are purely structural. A common theme in all of these boundaries is that they meet at triple junctions. Um, in the Northern Lao Basin, the type example of a triple junction is the Mangatolo triple junction, which is shown here in a map that was produced by uh, one of our students, Rebecca, Rebecca Mensing. And the MTJ or the Mangatolo triple junction turns out to be one of the largest magmatic centers in the Lao Basin formed by the anti-clockwise rotation of three microplates. And at its center is an axial volcanic complex with a volume of about 600 cubic kilometers, shown here in comparison to, for example, the upper Blake River uh, at about the same scale. The triple junctions like this are the cornerstones of crustal growth, growth for, for two reasons. One. Uh, there's simply a lot more melt in the system than in a comparable strike length of a single back arc spreading center. And secondly, a stable configuration like this uh, can last for millions of years, depending on the, the uh, far field uh, geodynamic uh, scenario. The Mangatolo triple junction, which was, uh, which was here, is mainly an old back arc crust. Uh, a very different triple junction is just about to emerge at the southern end of the Fonolai Rift which is propagating into the, um, the crust of the Tonga Arc, the geological map here, which I'll describe in a minute. Um, this is a perspective view of the Fonolai Rift and at its southern end where it's pr propagating into the Tonga Arc, it drops from an average water depth of about 2000 meters down, down to about three kilometers into a deep, basically a deep hole um, at the propagating tip. If this was if this was in in the Blake River, it'd be like walking from Clifford Ben Nevis down into the uh, Naranda uh, volcanic complex. At the tip of the rift, there is a melt corridor uh, that has developed uh, with a strike length of well over 100 kilometers, with bifurcating um, melt pathways resulting from the regional transtension uh, in the northern part of the basin. And interestingly, there are magmatic precursors of the arc rifting that can be clearly identified at least 50 kilometers in advance of the propagating tip. And at these locations, we're seeing pre-rift eruptions, basically uh, uh, volcanic cones and calderas, which are shown here, um, that are erupting uh, about, 30 about 50 kilometers from the rift tip and about 30 kilometers from the active front of the volcanic arc. It should be about a million years or maybe less uh, before the rift tip actually reaches these volcanoes and forms another triple junction that uh, probably will be tapping uh, multiple uh, melt sources. So throughout the arc and the back arc, the melt is clearly distributed in ways that we don't fully understand yet. Uh, one of the intriguing areas is in the middle of the back arc, uh, located about here, where we have um, uh, very many uh, small interplate volcanoes basically everywhere, even where there are no spreading centers, suggesting that the entire back arc region is heavily intruded by melt. This is something that we need to explore uh, in greater detail. Another aspect that we're looking at is the highly variable sedimentation within the back arc uh, across the arc to back arc transition. This is being unraveled by one of our master students, uh, Jesse Cahu who is using uh, high resolution acoustic imaging in the basin sediments. And her model shows that the basin opening has repeatedly jumped from one side of the basin to the other, first in the east, then in the west, and now again in the, uh, back in, in, in the east, indicating a, high, a very complicated uh, sequence of events leading to uh, basin opening. 
What we had not appreciated by mapping at one to a million scale is the prevalence of rifting along the arc front. And another student, Alex Gray, is working uh, in the, on the Louisville segment of the arc front, uh, which is currently subducting a seamount chain. And you can see a notable change in the uh, trajectory of the arc where the seamount chain is being, is being subducted. This has resulted in significant inflation of the arc and back arc crust, uh, thickening of the crust with a major uh, back arc volcanic field shown in purple here, and uh, segmentation along the arc front. These purple volcanoes are the arc front volcanoes, and the segmentation consists of a series of, in gray, on echelon graben structures um, that are punctuated by volcanic cones and, more importantly, by uh, large calderas. This is the same locality now looking south towards New Zealand, um, and it shows an abrupt transition from the back arc, which is dominated by normal faulting, indicated by the beach balls here, uh, onto the active arc front, which is dominated by strike slip faulting. And there are at least four of these transtensional basins developed along the arc front for at least several hundred kilometers in advance uh, of the back arc rift in response to the transtension created by the subduction of the Louisville Seamount chain. These grabens are just like the, Funa, the end of the Funalai Rift. Uh, they're at least a kilometers deep, and each one of them has at its center a central volcanic complex that's about the size of the Naranda, Naranda Cauldron. There are three of them shown here. Uh, we've known about these, these calderas for a long time, uh, in particular in the, um, um, in the southernmost graben structure here, the mo giant Manawai cal caldera which is the largest of these complexes, in fact, one of the largest calderas of its kind in the ocean. Uh, but what we didn't know uh, until it was revealed by Alex mapping was just how, how um, uh, abundant the arc rifting was. And it turns out that the sizes of the, uh, the uh, intra-arc calderas, these big intra-arc calderas, they look to, to be scaling with the width of the grabens themselves. And so the combination of the deeper water and the crustal thinning is probably a, um, a key for large scale magmatic uh, and hydrothermal activity associated with these large caldera structures. Two other large volcanic centers where uh, our guys are working um, include the uh, Rochambeau Rifts and the Northwest Lyle Spreading Center. Michael Ryan is producing uh, geological maps at about one to uh, a quarter million in these locations. The Rochambeau rifts are the focus of plume-influenced back arc spreading, and you can see the effect of sinistral transtension that is, uh, that, uh, is prevalent throughout this part of the basin and is clearly enhancing crustal permeability. And again, at the center of the rift is uh, now occupied by several hundred cubic kilometers of melt, which we, don't just, we just don't see anywhere else. And you know, this includes a large um, a shield volcano which again, about the size of the Miranda volcanic complex. Uh, up in the northeast corner of the basin now, uh, Melissa Anderson has shown how complicated things can get. Um, here, there, there are voluminous day site uh, lava flows, eruptions from the Nuatahi volcano uh, on one part, in one part of the basin, in another part of the basin, new uh, fresh bonanitic melts are being erupted at the Mata volcanoes or the Mata Dyke Complex, and all of this is bounded by a trench fault, by a back arc spreading center, and by rifted uh, arc basement. I mean, in a place like this, you can take your pick. Any one of these is a, is a, is a possible analog for something like the eastern part of the, of the, of the Blake River. Another student, Mary Besaw, is working, just finishing her master's on the formation of the uh, major triple junction in the adjacent North Fiji Basin. In this case, the triple junction was initiated by rapid uh, propagating um, uh, um, fracture zone, which was driven westward by the rotation of Fiji and eventually intersected the back arch spreading centers in the North Fiji Basin. And when it connected with the back arch spreading centers, it produced uh, another major volcanic center and large axial shield volcano, again, about 100 cubic, cubic kilometers in size. This is Mary's map, uh, which confirmed a, an anomalous topography uh, centered at the, at the triple junction, um, which is well above what has been suggested as being uh, isostatically supported. And it suggests that there's a hot, hot upper mantle beneath, beneath the triple junction. 
what's interesting is that it's uh, it's been uh, in this configuration or as, as, uh, for at least the last million years. And the stability is obviously an important factor in localizing voluminous mafic magnetism uh, uh, in the basins. Again, Lake River at the same scale. The stability of the North Fiji Triple Junction is in part due to the migration of the New Hebrides Arc, where another type of rifting is occurring in the Coriolis troughs. Um, these are, are remarkable uh, um, near arc rifts that have dropped uh, uh, from sea level to more than three kilometers deep and are forming only 25 kilometers from, from the arc front. And in those grobbins there are, or in those rifts, there are, again, large concentrations, 100 or so cubic kilometers of melt forming a large shield volcano with a big caldera uh, that's filled the rift in just a few million, just a few million years. So our catalog of these settings is, is getting pretty extensive and we think we're, we're approaching the point where we can start picking them apart and, and making specific comparisons to, to greenstone belts, we hope. Um, um, but the, um, the diversity of the different locations is expanding uh, in part because of our, our short course or at least our, our training course, which we've just established. Um, and one example of a new map that has been produced during that training exercise a few weeks ago was in the eastern uh, Galapagos, uh, the western portion of the Galapagos Rift where it's intersecting the East Pacific Rise. Uh, Rebecca and Jesse created a new map of this area where it had never been mapped before in, in, in just a few days. Um, in this case, the westward propagating tip of the Galapagos Rift is racing to meet the East Pacific rise, but it can never really get there because, the, because of the strong headwind of new crust being produced by the fast spreading EPR. And so in this location, the result is a combination of, of enhanced melting and exposure of deep parts of some of the youngest oceanic crust on earth produced uh, at the East Pacific rise. This is essentially a tectonic window down to the mantle. It's a hole that's about five kilometers deep and it's allowed access to fluids that have fluxed melting and produced off-axis gabbros and pegmatites, as well as intense hydrothermal alteration. It's just another example of a triple junction that we're exploring, and also an example of a geological map of, of a certain quality that did not exist uh, up until a few weeks ago. Finally, um, Meg was supposed to, uh, to present this, and I threw it in in the last minute. Meg, Meg, I hope tomorrow we'll talk about our new map in easternmost Papua New Guinea, which highlights some much more complicated microplate mosaics and assemblage boundaries where whenever thicker uh, crust is involved, especially continental crust, uh, as in the case of Eastern Papua New Guinea. Here are the marginal basins, the offshore marginal basins, or three of them are, are um, uh, completely different, three completely different volcano tectonic domains, one that's very much arc-like all the way to one that's very much uh, oceanic, each of them about the size of the Abitibi greenstone belt. We're working on several different studies in this region. Meg, I hope we'll talk about them, but one I'll, I'll mention uh, is really a lesson in uh, crustal juxtaposition in these environments. And this is the example of the Western Woodlark Basin um, where deep metamorphic crust of the Australian margin here, shown in cartoons fashion here, is being exhumed immediately adjacent to um, actively spreading oceanic crust. The plate boundary here is a major detachment and the metamorphic rocks cur are currently rising out of the sea here at about uh, 14 centimeters a year, about as fast as some of the fastest uh, spreading centers. These rocks consist of intensely deformed green schist facies metavolcanics uh, with abundant syntectonic quartz veining. They could be from anywhere in the Abitibi greenstone belt, but I've never dredged anything like this from the ocean floor before. Um, these rocks have been down to 40 kilometers, but they've also come back up in less than a million years and, and are now parked in the middle of a young oceanic basin. So we're exploring for these different scenarios uh, and uh, really guided by the idea that if there are this many different types of microplate boundaries and assemblage boundaries in just a few examples that I've cited now, then why, why not in the, in the Abitibi? And the goal now is to build some type sections, uh, including magma volumes, uh, structural styles, sedimentation uh, patterns, and, and volcanic rock compositions that can be compared to metal earth transects. A big, a big challenge in this is going to be the third dimension. Uh, but many of these locations that I've already talked about, shown on this plot, 
have uh, exposed several kilometers of, of, uh, of crust that together with seismic data, I think we should be able to, uh, should enable some closer comparisons with, uh, with the Middle Earth uh, transects. So that's my summary of the, uh, of the, the most recent update. Um, and I hope Mag will be back with us to, uh, tomorrow to talk about um, Papua New Guinea. Thanks very much, Mark. Uh, we have time for a question, if there's one out there. I have a question. Uh, really nice talk, Mark. The maps are incredible, and all the similarities are also really interesting to learn about. I was just wondering, while you're talking, what do you think the preservation potential for the Lao Basin is in the future, when you're forming so much new crust? Yeah, well, I mean, it's generally believed to be the... the uh, the birthplace of a new continent. This is the, the area that uh, um, New Zealand has called uh, Zealandia. And it's very likely that all of this crust will be, will be preserved um, uh, once Zealandia emerges and, and uh, is amalgamated with uh, the older crustal elements to the, to the, to the west. So I, I'm a pretty firm believer that that at least in that location uh, that crust is going to be preserved the stuff in the middle of the pacific like the Galap western galapagos rift okay probably not but that's an opportunity uh, at least to see something that um, might not be preserved okay, thanks